Hello, hello everyone, welcome. It's so wonderful to see so many people here this evening. Oh, friends, colleagues, council members, mayor. Uh, wow, really, really fun. We are so excited that you have taken tonight to come and spend with us in an evening of cultural conversations. So I just wanna give you a hand and say thank you for showing up. Okay, just a few, few housekeeping. You know about the cell phone rule. If you have your cell phone uh, live, if you could pr please silent it, that would be uh, appreciated. Okay, great. Welcome to our fourth annual evening presentation of cultural conversations in the, in the CC, the council chambers. Okay. Our theme tonight is beyond what we see. Tonight we will be exploring moving beyond the cultural assumptions that we make about people at first glance and experience how we might find points of connection with others when we take a moment and pause, listen, open ourselves to other perspectives and challenge ourselves to be courageous and learn about others with sincere curiosity. That's the theme of our evening. To kick off our evening is someone very familiar with this welcoming space of uh, Council Chambers. He calls Council Chambers his home every Monday night. <laughs> John Chelmanak, Bellevue's new mayor, has been invested in serving the city and the east side for a very long time. He has served on Bellevue City Council since 2004 and has twice been deputy mayor. What we know at first glance is that he is consistent, he is invested while he works a full-time job in the private sector. He is a native of the Pacific Northwest and a proud graduate of Washington State University. Got that right. Okay, go, go Cougs. The mayor is a longtime Bellevue resident. He has a head and a heart for really knowing the community and serving you who live, work, and visit Bellevue. As we do this important work, Mayor Chelmanak is a champion of the city's diversity advantage plan and the council vision. Bellevue welcomes the world, diversity is our strength. I'd like to have uh, Mayor Chelmanak come up and say a few words, thank you. Thank you. Did you want me to introduce that or you I will do that, okay. I will do that. Okay, you have that. Okay. Well, good evening everyone. Welcome, wow, overflow crowd here tonight. And that is wonderful to have this conversation. So my name is John Chulmanak and um, I've been the mayor for just a little over a month now, but I've been on the city council for 14 years. I want to, uh, and actually, I'm gonna introduce them as part of my family because Monday nights we get together, we have dinner, every Monday night together as a family. So two of my family members are here tonight. That is Council Member Lynn Robinson, who is our Deputy Mayor, and Council Member Conrad Lee, former Mayor of the city and uh, our longest serving council member. So please welcome them. And I believe that Council Member John Stokes, um, who had just served as Mayor, is also going to be here tonight. So this is a wonderful time to come together as a connected community, a resilient community, and also I think in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a beloved community. That's what we strive to be. Now, you're looking beyond the surface tonight at people, so I'm gonna let you in a little bit on me. I'm an orphan. I wasn't orphaned as a small child. I was just orphaned last year. My mother passed away in 1984. My dad lived to be 96 years old and passed away on March 17th last year. He was really my best friend um, and a huge supporter of mine. But that now makes me an orphan and I have to carry on um, the responsibilities of our family. One of those, and I think a lot of you would have the same experience, a lot of your cultural connection to family is around food. And for me, being Polish-American, it's about kielbasa, that great Polish sausage. Dad and I and uh, my children and my siblings, we made it every single year. 
It was always present at celebrations, and particularly at Christmas time. Some of the best pictures I have of my stepdaughter and daughter growing up are of them going through that process of making sausage. So with dad gone, that fell to me this year. I didn't even know where to go to get the casings, but I figured it out. Um, and on a Saturday afternoon with my daughter back from uh, Gonzaga, we spent that time together continuing a family tradition and advancing our culture by even though dad was gone, we sat together, made Polish sausage, and it was delicious on a white Christmas, which is very rare to have that uh, as, uh, as our uh, breakfast. So that's a little something different about me, something you didn't know. I know that you'll all be sharing some stories looking beyond what we look like to who we truly are. So thank you all for being here. I'm gonna turn it back over to Carol and I know she's gonna introduce Brad Miyake, our city manager. Thank you again for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. So I may be repeating a little bit, but I also want to make sure that I uh, really formally recognize some people that we have not had an opportunity, and that's Deputy Mayor Lynn Robinson. Okay. 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 All right. Okay. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to recognize the, the elected officials who are here tonight for their support and leadership with the city of Bellevue and the greater east side. And uh, were, was there anyone else that we may have missed? I just want to make sure that we've got everybody. Con and Conrad Lee, correct. Okay. We cannot, <laughs> okay. we cannot do the work of cultural conversations without the support and leadership of our energetic, engaging, and inspiring city manager, Brad Miyake. And uh, just wanted to recognize Brad, if he's in the room. Okay. Brad Miyake. And also his hard working leadership team. Uh, we have, uh, I think, Dave Berg from Transportation here and Joy St. Germain, just a few of the people that are in the room that are part of the leadership team. Can we give them a, a round of applause? Thank you. So for many of you here, this is the first time. What is this program of Cultural Conversations? Cultural Conversations is a, a place of safe place for community connection that inspires change through storytelling, new friendships, awareness of diverse cultures, and common bonds. Many times we're asked about this program, what is cultural conversations? You know, uh, you know people are getting together, they're having coffee, they're talking. What, what is it that goes on there? And the thing that we would tell you, and anybody that's ever been, would say, you have to come and experience it yourself. You really just have to be here. So we're hoping tonight that you will also be able to understand what makes this program so special uh, for many of the, the, the people that are here tonight. And there are very many ambassadors of the program that are here. And uh, what I want to do, um, a wonderful community uh, that has been a storyteller or attended a cultural conversation, if you could just stand and wave your hand so everybody knows who you are. If anybody attended a cultural conversation, or wave your hand, yeah. The very many people that attend cultural conversations. You are the heart and soul of the program. The topics, the learning, and the connection, it comes from and through you. So we really appreciate your uh, attendance and your dedication. It is my honor to do this program with my partner, Bob Tuninga, who along with Julie Ellenhorn took the seed of this idea, listening to women in the community, and that's become the program that you see today. Barb has been with the city for over 20 years. If you could listen in on how we form these uh, topics and how they develop, you would know that we are so honored to hear the stories of so many courageous and remarkable women and men in the community. In fact, going beyond what we see, we know that everybody here tonight is remarkable. Doing this program, we know how we are changed as individuals, we see the changes in others, and witness the vibrant, connected community growing here on the east side and beyond. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming Barb Taninga, who's gonna come up and talk a little bit about, about the program. Thank you. Thank you. 
So I think you all know how much I love this program. Um, we are so grateful to have the opportunity to plan and participate in cultural conversations like Carol said. I've had the pleasure of planning this program with Julie, Ying, Carol, just about everybody on our neighborhood outreach team and it's been life changing truly for the neighborhood outreach team and for the community and for me personally. Um, it's just been an honor to witness and be a part of the sort of, I, I think of it as unlikely connections in the community because they, those connections create so much resiliency in our community and it really, it really is amazing to, to watch and be a part of. So the community of cultural conversations has grown much larger since we began the program in 2009. Um, we get requests every year for us to help others with this program as far away as Somalia, uh, as close as neighborhood groups and apartment buildings and faith communities and schools right here in Bellevue. People ask, can we have a men's only group? Can we do this program in the evening? Can we do this program on the weekends? Can we have programs for small kids? Can we have programs for teens? So this year we decided to go a little bit further with documenting the program and created a best practices handbook for organizers to encourage all of you to help others and help yourselves create your own unique cultural conversations. So this is it and it's available for you as you leave to tonight and you're welcome to that. And it's also gonna be soon available on the website. So real quickly, Sujata, where are you Sujata? There you are. So um, she walked into cultural conversations a couple of years ago, newly arrived from India with a business card that read corporate and community storyteller. And the rest is history. Sujata has helped us document cultural conversations. Um, and this year she's helped us to create that, that best practices guide that will help more people start programs like this. Uh, I just wanna tell you that after the story part, storytelling part of the program will give you a, more details about the second part and when you go out to tables to, to connect with other people. But for now, I just wanted to focus on dessert because actually what's more important than dessert, right? <laughs> so you will see really amazing dessert platters provided by the French bakery at all of your tables. Um, it's become a tradition at Cultural Conversations to drink tea and eat pastries and goodies from French bakery. And um, I just, we, we wanted to mention that, that their story, Melanie and Kim's story, the owners of, of the Crossroads Bakery, is really tied to tonight's theme, um, exploring beyond what you see. As you grab your tea or coffee on your way to your table, just take a minute to take a peek at the storyboard that talks about Melanie and Kim's story of starting the French bakery, or actually buying the French bakery that was already existing. I'm gonna read a quick quote from a longtime participant of Cultural Conversations about the bakery and Melanie and Kim. When people meet Melanie and Kim, often there's a brief pause. You don't expect to see an Asian couple running the French bakery, especially one so authentically French. And they are much more than that. Their philosophy, Melanie and Kim's philosophy, is all about helping people, mentoring their staff, um, even do donating food to the community every day that their bakery is open. So Melanie and Kim, can you just stand briefly real quick so that we can thank you for all you do for the community? Okay, we're gonna start the storytelling. Um, I always like to remind everyone before we start the story, storytelling that these amazing and courageous storytellers are not professional storytellers. They, um, they, they are here tonight because we asked them would they be willing to tell their stories. And um, I just think it's important to take a minute to recognize that it takes so much courage to get up and share personal stories, um, some in their second and even third language. And so I'd ask you to hold that sacred and to send positive energy to them when they come up here to share. Um, our storytellers often mention that they could feel your support and they can feel your respect while they're telling their stories during this program. 
and your support creates that safe space that Carol was referring to at the beginning. So with that, we'd like to turn the program over to Debbie Lacey. She's our storytelling coach. She's been with us from the very beginning. Debbie. Just real quick so we can get to these amazing stories tonight. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, what a gift this evening is to gather in community, to hear stories, just as people all over the world um, have been doing for thousands of years. Many of our ancestors um, have been doing this very thing, telling stories and listening to stories. The author Terry Tempest Williams said that story is the umbilical cord that connects us to the past, present, and future. She goes on to say that story is a relationship between the teller and the listener, a responsibility. And story is an affirmation of our ties to one another. She speaks of the responsibility, and that's something we witnessed during these events. The storytellers aren't the only ones with a job here. Don't be nervous, I'm not going to ask you all to come up to the stage. Some of you may want to after tonight. You're all part of the story though, by giving your attention, by reflecting on your own experiences, you'll naturally weave your story into theirs. We invite you to listen for parts of the stories that remind you of your own experiences, however diverse, and to listen for moments that speak to experiences maybe that you'd like to have or that you'd like to know more about. Another part of our responsibility is to hold the stories as unique expressions of the people telling them. We must avoid the danger of a single story. That is the assumption that any one story or any one's story speaks for an entire group of people, which of course is impossible. Tonight's stories are about their truth, their reality. Your experiences, values, and beliefs may be similar or quite different, but these stories aren't about persuasion or debate. Every story is an invitation to understand and to connect. We honor the vulnerable, brave act it is to stand here in front of a large audience. By the way, you all look fabulous. I wish you could see you from this point of view. It's been my great privilege and honor to work with and support tonight's storytellers, hearing many more stories than you will share here tonight. And I know you'll be inspired and, and touched as I have been. This night belongs to our storytellers who've put so much into preparation, and it belongs to us as a community taking an evening out of our busy lives to hear stories that have the ability to transport us, opening our eyes and our hearts to the many different ways we as humans journey through life. You may have questions for the speakers, um, but we ask that you hold your questions until the second part of the program when you'll have an opportunity to chat with them um, and with each other. So at this time, I would like to invite Karen um, to get settled. And as Karen's coming up, to the stage, I'd like to introduce her. Karen was born and raised in Jamaica, where her family has lived for several generations. At 17 years old, she moved to Florida with her parents. It was the start of her westward migration, as she calls it, a journey of adventure that took her to Canada for college and then up and down the West Coast as a journalist, book publisher, and technical editor. She's lived in Bellevue since 1987. And this evening, we're going to do an interview style format. Karen, welcome, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Can you tell us um, a little bit about when you first lost your vision and the extent of your vision loss so everyone gets a better understanding? Of course. As a baby, I began crawling into walls. I was beginning the first stage of retinal degeneration. But I was lucky because I still had a fair bit of functional vision. And as I grew with support from family, friends, teachers, I just charged ahead. School, sports, uh, travel, parties. <laughs> <laughs> then in the 1990s, a sort of dimmer switch went on in my eyes and my remaining vision began to fade. Now I can see glimmers of light, and because that light often bothers me, I wear sunglasses indoors as I'm doing tonight. 
Thanks so much for that, Karen. And I know you do many of the same things, as you mentioned, that we all do in a typical day, um, probably more than some of us do. Um, and you also do some things that people may be a bit surprised about. Can you share a little about that? Yeah. Uh, well, as that dimmer switch went on, I realized that there were still a lot of things I wanted to do and could do. I just had to learn to do them differently. So whether that was through touch or with technology. Um, for example, I love movies. Now there is a technology called audio description that will tell me what's going on, the action, between the dialogue. So I don't have to lean over to my neighbor and say, so what's happening now? <laughs> <laughs> I also love to travel. Yes. And uh, before, you know, uh, earlier in my life, I had traveled widely uh, in North and Central America. And uh, now, with the increasing vision loss and eventual blindness, I found myself traveling even farther to places like Australia and Europe and even South America. So when I get ready, uh, I know I'm going somewhere on a trip, I start to think about the place and try to read up on it, maybe take a class, uh, maybe listen to some YouTube videos, just to get a real sense of where I'm going. Uh, I'm trying to essentially create a movie in my mind. So I went to Machu Picchu in Peru a while back. And the guide and I were standing on the terrace there. And he said to me, we're looking out over this magnificent valley. And there are these tall, craggy mountains all around us. And I turned to him and I said, yeah, I can see it. And I really felt like I could. I had a real sense of it. Now, I was also using my other senses. And other people around me soon realized this. And everyone sort of pitched in because they were determined to make my sensory experience as wonderful as their visual experience. <coughs> Another part of travel is that uh, one of the reasons I think why I'm not intimidated by it is that I am very organized. A place for everything and everything in its place. And so, uh, when I get ready to, uh, to go somewhere, even, even if it's just around Bellevue, I think about where I'm going, I plan it out, I break the trip down into stages or steps, and I try to visualize each step. And then, because my dog goes just about everywhere with me. I do have a dog. He's down here on the floor, <laughs> a guide dog. Uh, then we take off. And I give him the commands, and he navigates from point A to point B. Now, as an aside to that, uh, a little tip. Uh, he is trained to intelligently disobey. And that keeps us out of harm's way. He will actually not do something that I tell him if he deems that that's going to put us in danger. So if, whenever you see a guide dog team working, it's best not to try to distract them, even inadvertently, by reaching out and petting the dog or speaking to the dog. You know, just accept that they're, they're doing their thing. They're OK. Yeah. So that said, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
things don't always go to plan. <laughs> uh, a while back, he and I went to Paris. And it's, it is a beautiful city, and there are lots of wonderful people there. But we quickly realized there were a few hurdles for us. So over there, traffic lights are simply for decoration. <laughs> <laughs> and sidewalks are parking lots for motorcycles. So it was a bit difficult to get around. That said, you know, this is where we don't do things just on our own. You know, it, it, other people help. People we know and people we don't know. Because when we ran into trouble, we hijack someone on the sidewalk and in a very broken mixture of languages, <laughs> <laughs> try to figure it out with them. But that led to some great conversations. And I would never have met these people in any other way. Thank you, Karen. I imagine that um, you know, you've accomplished so much and, and gone to so many places. Do you still have things on your bucket list? And I should clarify for some of you that may have English as a second language what a bucket list is. Um, it can sound very strange if uh, you don't know about that. So um, sometimes people refer to dying as kicking the bucket. And so <laughs> a bucket list is the things that you would like to do before you kick the bucket. So Karen, <laughs> anything on your bucket list? Well, more travel for sure, and um, I want to finish learning Braille. I'm getting really close. I never learned it as a child because I went to regular schools, so I'm playing catch up. And I'm also working on digitizing my lifetime of print photos. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> I'm sure many of us share that goal. Uh, in addition to thinking that people who are blind stay close to home all the time, what are some other incorrect assumptions that people make about people with vision loss? <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the major ones is that we're aloof and unfriendly. And what's really going on is that we are just waiting for cues so that we don't say or do something inappropriate. Another one is that when you pop up at our elbow in the grocery store, totally out of context, and say hi, we'll immediately recognize who you are. <laughs> <laughs> now, <laughs> Siri and Alexa can't seem to, to get it right, so, you know, <laughs> me? <laughs> Far better if you, uh, far better if you uh, say something like, you know, hey, Karen, it's Debbie from Cultural Conversations. <laughs> uh, another one is um, that because we're very tactile, and I, I'm trying not to be tonight, <laughs> because of this thing, but is that we're always touching things, feeling, what is this? And because of that, we'll want to get up close and personal. So, <laughs> uh, uh, a man I know from some classes we have taken together came up to me in class one day and said, would you like to touch my face? <laughs> would you like to see what I look like? Now, <laughs> 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 we have a mutual friend who is blind and who knows him far better than I do. And apparently, she had asked him if she could do that. Great. Now he thought, maybe I'd like to do that. <laughs> and so I sat there for a moment and I thought, you know, I'm from an island culture. You know, everybody hugs and kisses at the drop of a hat. And 
could this be the Seattle freeze setting in? <laughs> but, you know, I said to him, uh, well, thank you, but uh, I think I'll pass this time. <laughs> Karen, uh, thank you for that. And I, I've been teasing um, Karen lately because now when I pop up next to her, I say, Debbie, it's, I mean, Karen, it's Debbie from Cultural Conversations. <laughs> but I've been trained well. Um, you know, a lot of us take for granted the information that we get upon seeing someone for the first time and how that helps form our impressions of them. And um, what's it like for you not being able to see as part of helping you form those impressions and get to know people? It's challenging, no doubt about it. Um, of course, I do try to use my other senses to get a picture of the person. And it's remarkable what sort of information you can pick up about a person from their handshake or their hug or you know, even their choice of cologne. But still, there are gaps and I will often turn to uh, a third person, uh, you know, and to, to, to find out. Of course, <laughs> that can be tricky. So when I was growing up in Jamaica, it was a very diverse, multicultural melting pot. People from all backgrounds would routinely describe themselves and others very openly <laughs> by skin tone, hairstyle, height, weight, uh, and uh, other physical characteristics. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so they were describing what they were seeing in front of them very honestly. That was great for someone with vision loss. But in today's world, I turn to my friend and I say, what's she like? And that person turns to me and says, she's a woman of color. So they are taking in the descriptive details and they are giving me the label that we've agreed on uh, for preventing discrimination. But I need details like skin tone for description, not discrimination. And so I'm thinking, what color? <laughs> I want to paint a picture in my mind of the person. I don't want them to be roaming around in my brain as a blob. <laughs> Just as if, you know, uh, my friend would say, well, you know, she braids her hair and she uses all these little colored beads and they just perfectly match her outfit. Mm. Mm -hmm. Karen, um, my last question for you is about tonight's theme of Beyond What We See. As you reflect on the, some of the things that you've shared with us tonight, what does that mean to you? Well, for me, it's, it's that I hope we can all strive to be less superficial and perhaps more empathetic to see not just this, but this. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you. Our next storyteller is Ben Shahabi. Ben is best known for his work as an IT content developer for the city of Bellevue and Bellevue TV. I know he's well known by, by many of the staff and council members here. Benny, ben helps share stories, but few have heard his story. 
Ben was born in Iran and recalls a happy early childhood, but when he was seven, the Iranian revolution began that resulted in the toppling of the monarchy. The new regime put an end to the Western lifestyle that Ben was accustomed to. Ben recalls no longer being able to wear t-shirts and jeans. The women in his family who had not worn veils before no longer had the choice of being covered. All non-religious music was banned, along with movies from the US and other Western countries. As Ben got older and sought a career in the film industry, he worked hard, eventually earning a salary three times what his father made in the army. But Ben became increasingly unhappy when he realized he wouldn't be able to fulfill his dreams due to the strict regulations on the film industry and heavy censorship from the government on the art. Around that time, Ben met the woman who would become his wife, Mona. Mona was of the Baha'i faith, and that put her at great risk in Iran at that time. Since the revolution, Baha'is have been systematically persecuted. During the first decade following the revolution, more than 200 Baha'is were killed, hundreds more were tortured or imprisoned. Mona's family decided to send her away from Iran to protect her. Hastily, Ben decided to go with her, and in only two weeks' time, he left everything and everyone he had ever known. The couple made their way to Turkey, got married, and waited there for 18 months before being granted refugee asylum to the U.S. Ben's story, A Different Lens, begins in Arizona. Please help me welcome Ben Shahabi. Okay, it's been an honor to be here, especially in front of some great speakers. Uh, it could be, and I, I, I'm always behind the camera, and this is re really hard for me being in front of the camera. Let's see how I can do it. <laughs> in 2003, our plane landed to the Arizona with zero dollar in our pocket because we have to stay a year and a half in Turkey waiting for the visa. Me and my wife Mona were there at the corner. We came and everything was pretty new to us. I mean, the freeways, the huge stores, everything. And back then we didn't have internet, so we couldn't really know where we're going. But we have a cloud over our head. We came to Arizona and an agency take us and uh, they told me you have an option. So they find a place for us to leave for a few months. And they told me you have an option of working the gas station or dishwasher. And I knew it, even though I have my license and I have a great, but I knew it, this is a big change. I have to start from zero. I accepted a uh, gas station because I thought maybe it helped me to improve my languages. It was good the first few months, uh, but we find that this is not the place we gotta spend the rest of our life. It was hot over there. <laughs> 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 and then people ask me, you're from Iran, it's desert. And honestly, it's not. I mean, if you just uh, Google and search, it's not. I mean, <laughs> center of the Iran, yes, but north is pretty green like here. We decided, Let's move. And we've been stupid enough from hottest, go to the coldest to Chicago. <laughs> and we get there, and unfortunately, we get some racism issue. And again, I knew it's OK. You know, they told me, if you cannot speak English, go back to your country. <sighs> I break my heart. I cried that night. But I knew it. I had a goal in my, uh, over my head. And I knew I got a skill. I try to be a nice person. I just try to be a good citizen. What is that? That's OK. A few months later, we find out, yeah, we cannot stay here either. Back to Arizona, go to California. And people told us, what are you doing? You have to build your credit. You have to stay somewhere and build. I said, well, I'm not happy. How can I? I want to find some place, call it home, be happy over there. 2006, August 2006, I've got a friend here in Redmond from 120 degree in Arizona. We got to come and visit her. We passed over the 520. People was boating, ski boating, green. I said, this is heaven. <laughs> this is the place. <laughs> and people call Seattle breeze. I want to sell Seattle trap. Because <laughs> they tell you in August is great. But <laughs> you see the rest. Uh, but you know what? No, it's work for us. Me and Mona, we find out we love here is green. And uh, uh, we can build our future here. So I was lucky I find a, a work in the uh, a construction, little construction company based in Issaquah. So we go to the people's house and fix the door, window, plumbing, things. 
And uh, I was so happy, yeah, the thing is good going on. 2008, during the recession, uh, economy goes well, and that little construction company get out of business. I go to the other agency, I said, yeah, I need a job. I didn't expect, they told me, hey, here is red carpet, go to the camera, you know. I expect for low, but that's okay, I gotta uh, start to find something. And they told me there is a company based in Factoria, they need a driver, can you drive? Yeah, I can drive. I go there the day after, it was a full size van, it was a printing company, and they gave me the box and said, okay, go ahead, deliver it to, Isakwa. I was lucky because I was working there over there and I knew the uh, uh, places. So I go and come back by half an hour. They say, wow, that's good. Next one was in the Fifth Street in Seattle. With full size van, narrow street. <laughs> that's okay. I never say no because I knew I'm not in the position to say no. Even though I got my bachelor, I got good income, I got, but I'm here, I have to build some, something. And back then, if you remember the Thomas book, do you guys remember? It was a navigation. <laughs> So I got some hiking skill back in the Iran. So that skill, 1,000 miles away, helped me because I really get fast, fam very fa familiar with this book. And I easily could find you know, north, east, south. And to me, it was best street sign here in Seattle. In Iran, they name it after who, uh, the people who died in the war. Memorial of the Ben, Memorial of the John, Memorial of Fifth Street, Memorial, Memorial. And <laughs> it was so confusing, but here, it start from the numbers, northeast, southeast, it was great. So after two months, again, I become a really good driver from South Tacoma to North Everett. <laughs> and part of my job was going to the Microsoft. Each time I go to the Microsoft, you know, I was happy with the home. I find a nice place I love. But going there, I said, now I'm starting to get worried about my job. You know, I'm not this person to deliver. It, it, it's a great job. Some people like it, but I didn't came for this. And I know I have some skill. And I, I, I want to be, now I want to be a better citizen to can, you know, bring my culture, bring my, sit, uh, bring my skill and talent to the, this community. I start to getting, ah, going there, see Microsoft people, what I'm doing. Suddenly, one day, when I was pushing the hand truck, I saw the film crew. I forget about the hand truck and boxes. I ran to them and said, wow, can I see the camera? Can I touch it? I was so excited. And they've been rushing to the uh, they shoot. And they said, you know what, man, you have to start from the college. And I said, that's OK. But I came back that night, and again I cried. I said, God, do I not deserve to work in my work area, to, to things I like? I know I, I, I'm, I'm ready to pay everything for it. And that's okay, again, I knew it. Uh, 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 this is gotta be uh, tough for me. In 2000, uh, and, uh, yeah, 2012, I end up to go to the, walk to the Bellevue College in the uh, uh, television department. Beautiful uh, gentleman named Rick Audi. He very welcome, and that was really important. Warm, welcoming at the first. Because of my skin color and my language, I'm always afraid to go, should I go to the college? Can I compete with the, you know, other people? Can I do my best? So warm welcoming was really melt our, my eyes. You know, I said, wow, thank you. I mean, I love him. I, I always see the uh, wing behind him. <laughs> I always tell him, <laughs> you're amazing. So he warm welcoming. I took my uh, classes. As I get some support, financial aid support, some agency. They helped me because uh, Noha was born in that time. Hey, Noha. And then the three size family. And I have to just live with the work and study, little bit support. And believe me, three size family, 900 in 2012. I was the most happiest person because I'm studying my you know, career field, which was, I did it in Iran. And now I'm, I, I can do whatever I want. So part of the, uh, uh, my job was between college and city, there is a partnership. So they do, like right now, there is a people, people behind this room. Let's uh, run the applause for them. <laughs> they here, you cannot see them, but they are back there. Part of our job is come here and do the city council night. I meet all the <laughs> uh, council members and mayor every Monday night. And we do the other stuff for the city. So I basically start to working with the city and college while I start to doing my uh, uh, the study. And I said, okay, I love this job because when I was in Iran, I said, maybe I cannot f say my expression, my feeling. But when I'm behind the camera, behind the visor, I can find the things or see the things people may not see it. So that's what I find 
this, uh, I, I go this to this major and find this job. And I said, how can I bring it here? Now I'm going to the uh, city for construction filming or interview the mayor or council member or anything happening. How can I bring, how can I change it? One day I was in the mini city hall with Barbara Toninga. We supposed to interview two women. They've been immigrant from China and South America, and they, they go through really bad things, and they have to sit, tell their story. And imagine, they were in the room, light, camera, even I get shocked. And those two women, I saw behind the visor, something's not right, they feeling so nervous. And I asked Barbara, can I have a five minute? Look at me, what, what is he talking about? People going out, and sometimes people, I, I mean, the, you know, I don't know, some, I, you know what I, what I do? I go and say, I, I'm one of you. I can, I, I, I know what you go through. I go through those things. It works. And they, it, 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 they break their eyes, you know, and they, and they start to uh, talking after that. They were crying and tell their story. I was crying before the camera. And I find that I can help, I, you know, because, uh, and that connection, it wasn't word, it wasn't anything. It was just something we experienced it. And the other, uh, uh, sorry, Officer Lisa, I saw she here earlier, she has to talk about uh, uh, human traffic. You know, it's a, a very s sensitive subject. Again, they said, uh, Ben, this is an important subject. The, the things I do, you know, I, I'm, I'm really kind and loving people and hugging guy and always smile. And I get it from my mom, thanks mom. <laughs> So the, uh, the first thing I did, hug Lisa, and uh, you know, I said, forget about thing. Lisa, I start to tell her the story, and they said, this is another thing. I remember it was an Iraqian from Iraq, which we had a war back then in the, you know, uh, the 1972, uh, 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 three. He came to the uh, program, Bellevue College, and I saw him, he was so nervous, and I say, hey, I'm from Iran, you're from Iraq. And uh, I, I talked to him and break his, you know, I find that I can do all these things. So in 2012, oh, in 2014, uh, Microsoft called to the, our college and said, we're looking for one cameraman. And guess what? They told me to go there between the 20 students. <laughs> but this time, I go not with the card and hand throw, and I go with the camera. I cried that night again, but I was so happy this time. And I said, thank you, guys. I just, that night, the first night, I cry and I just, you know, I just Im image it, see it, and want it from the God. And just year and a half, I mean, especially the young audience here, it just happened because I was hardworking and I knew I'm a foreign, I'm a different country. I have to double work. I have to hard even more than uh, regular students. So that work. And I was with the camera now, so proud of myself. And uh, <laughs> coming, get hired by the city. After, in 2015, that was another, you know, honor. I mean, uh, not even get hired here, and uh, so I can do the job I love, the job I do. Beca I become a mentor and teacher for the new students, which they come into the program, go into the back, this back room, and I have to teach them. I mean, how did I? I didn't even think about that when I very first day I came to here. Right now, I, I think I, I have everything, and. All this is, yes, because I'm a hard worker, because I, I'm small, I love people, but honestly, it's because, because of you. Because you welcoming me, you opened the door for me, you accepted me, you believe in me. No matter who I am, what's my color, what's my religion, and give me the chance, give me the opportunity, I, sh I, I show myself, I bring my culture, I br bring my uh, uh, skills to hear this country and share with you. So thank you all of you for that. And now every single day when I'm coming out from the house, first of all, I say, thank you, God, where I am. I'm so, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm really, every single day I'm crazy and happy. And then when I'm walking to the work, every day from corner of my eyes, I'm looking for another guy pushing the hand truck. It could be another me and he wanna be, but this time, if he's coming and asking me, hey, be, hey man, can I be a cameraman or how? I'm not gonna tell him just go to the college. I say, come to my office. Come, you know, have a connection. How can I help you? I do my best to. Uh, so, so I'm so honored. Thank you so much for being here. I love you all and God bless everybody. <laughs> Thank you.
I'm, I'm putting one last slide up here. Um, that, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Ben. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, last week, it happened to I go back to Arizona, the place I start. <laughs> this is the gas station I start. <laughs> After 15 years, I go there. It was 10.30 PM. I walk in the, and the guy was behind the cashier. What the heck is this guy doing? 15 minutes walking and looking. The, and I told him my story. I was a star from here in this gas station with no language, with no money. And again, I cry when I go back to hotel. But this time. <laughs> It was so happy. I was so happy. I love you all. <laughs> Thank you again, Ben and Gina. And Gina Shulman is a life coach, a spouse and mother who moved to Bellevue four years ago, expecting that the city's reputation as a diverse community would include families like hers. She'll share her experience as an African American living in a city where changing demographics challenge us to move past initial assumptions about race and ethnicity. Please help me welcome Angina. Seventeen years ago, at the suggestion of my rabbi, I went on a trip to Israel with 40 other 20-somethings who were going to see the country for the first time. On that trip, I met my husband. Let me back up. I'm Jewish. <laughs> it was a quick romance, three weeks if you count our time in Israel. After that romance, Kirk had to move to Maryland to be with me, but he wanted me to meet his parents before he moved. He called his mother and told her he met a nice Jewish girl who graduated from an Ivy League school, loved art just like her, had a wonderful job in technology company in Maryland, and she was really excited to meet me. Kirk called to tell me the good news, and he relayed to me what he told her, and I panicked. Kirk, I asked him, did you tell your mother I'm black? <laughs> no, he said, you have to tell her. She has in her head what a nice Jewish girl looks like, and I don't fit that mold. He reluctantly agreed to call her back, and when he told her, she hung up the phone. Now, before you judge my mother-in-law, who is compassionate and a very educated woman, let's do an experiment. You guys game? Okay, close your eyes. I want you to picture an elephant it's a big elephant. It can be in the zoo, or maybe it's roaming around in the wild. OK, do you guys all see it? OK, open your eyes. How many of you saw a striped elephant? <laughs> Nobody saw a striped elephant? OK, one person, OK. <laughs> How many elephants had a trunk? Everyone's elephant had a trunk. Oh, awesome, OK. <laughs> we all categorize people, places, and things. It's normal. Time and familiarity help us recreate and expand our categories of people. My mother-in-law and I have a wonderful relationship now because of time, conver conversations, and grandchildren. <laughs> the same is true of Maryland, where I'm from. In Maryland, I was a striped elephant who was accepted and comfortable with my Jewish identity. My family had a synagogue we had attended since my kids were babies. And to the chagrin of my husband, the director of the synagogue was my first boyfriend's mother. <laughs> I tell you that to say that our community supported us inside and outside of the synagogue. We belonged. We didn't have to be anything but us. Four and a half years ago, we moved to Bellevue. When my husband told me of the possibility, I said, no, we're not moving. But once I knew the move was happening, I had two questions. As a black woman, I wanted to know where was I going to get my hair done. And for those of you that don't understand that, it's a whole ordeal, and I still haven't found a place in Bellevue where I can get my hair done. So if anybody has any recommendations, you can let me know later. OK, thank you. <laughs> and my second question was, where will we go to synagogue? So far, I found two options. 
Now, this was a huge surprise to me. In my community in Maryland, you do this thing called synagogue shopping. When you get married, you go to a different synagogue weekend after weekend. That could happen for two months until you find the synagogue that fits perfectly for you. With only two choices, it was going to be a really short shopping season. <laughs> but it was a dream job for my husband, so we moved. And we arrived in August, and as Ben said, anyone can fall in love with Bellevue in August. <laughs> But as the summer haze started to wear off, I started researching the schools that my kid would attend. And there was only 1% African-American students in that elementary school. But there was also another category, mixed ethnicity. And I thought, oh, how progressive of Bellevue. I've never seen that category before. And although I thought diversity would look a little different here, I wasn't worried because my kids had always been the only or one of two black children in their classes, so this wouldn't be a much different experience for them. But as the school year started, it dawned on me that Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, two of the big holidays in the Jewish faith, were going to fall the second week of school. It's lots of time at synagogue, a lot, of cooking, a lot of cooking, followed by a day of fasting. And these days were always given off in my community in Maryland. I was so concerned with moving and getting my first and third graders settled that I didn't notice that the days were not already given off. I went to school and told the front desk lady that my kids wouldn't be at school because of the holidays. Blank stares. <laughs> Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. More blank stares. Had there never been a Jewish family in this whole school who needed these days off for the holiest time in the Jewish calendar? I was shocked. I stood in the front office, and the lady handed me a form to get the days off, and I paused. Like any mother, I wanted my kids to feel safe, welcomed, and accepted. And in that moment, I didn't know if that was possible. We had a lot going on as a family. We'd only been in Bellevue one month. New home, new coast, new roles in our family, and this was the first time my kids had been in a, in a traditional school setting. I didn't know if they would be accepted for their differences. So in that moment, I slid the paper back across the counter and decided for the first time that my kids wouldn't attend high holiday services. My brain and body just wanted my kids to fit in. 1% African American, and from what I could tell, 0% Jewish. I can't turn down or turn off our blackness, but I can control how Jewish we seem in the world. My husband was more than happy to take a break from services that year, so I went to services alone. I felt a little afraid walking past the security guard at the door without my husband's overt Jewishness telling the world that I belonged. My hierarchy needs have been compromised. I had food, great food, from Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, and a great house, my dream house, farmhouse really close to downtown. But because of the newness and lack of seeing people like me or people who worship like me, my safety felt in jeopardy, and I made a choice. I chose invisibility. I didn't give people the opportunity to include or exclude me. And believe me, everybody wants to include me. Filipinos think I'm half Filipino. <laughs> when my hair is straight, Indians think I'm Indian. And Polynesians give you a nod to say like, oh yeah, we see you, girl. <laughs> and I've gotten really good at saying, oh, no hablo espanol. <laughs> I got an email from a parent at my younger kid's school telling me that a group of kids were getting together to form a math team. And the other kids said my daughter would be a great fit. I said, of course, wow, Kylie must be amazing at math if this woman is almost demanding that we join this group. So she asked me, why haven't we met you? Where are you? Why aren't you at the school? And I said, I'm at the school sometimes. I don't know why we haven't met. So we arrive at the door, 
and went in the house and sat down, and we were the only Indian people not there. All the parents were speaking the same language, except me. All the families knew to take off their shoes, except me. The kids had fun during math, and the parents were really nice, but we didn't get invited back to that math group. We didn't inquire why, and they didn't offer. They were looking for the group of elephants, and we didn't belong. People have asked me, why not move to Seattle? There are more black people there. True, but after four and a half years, Bellevue is my home. I recently learned that there are only 2.5% of Jewish people in King County. And US-wide, there are only 2% Jewish people of color. My family and I are more visible in our Jewishness these days. We have Passover seders where we're the only Jewish people at the table. We break the Yom Kippur fast with people who have eaten all day long. And we've even gone to the synagogue we belong to on a Friday night once. We've gone once. <laughs> we don't always fit in with our loud East Coast laughs, but we are showing up more often slowly finding our place in our greater community. And as I open up myself more and more over the years that I found that we've all felt like striped elephants from time to time. Chinese people who don't speak Chinese, parents who have children with disabilities and a sea full of kids who don't have disabilities, and Seattleites who don't like the Seahawks. I have a great family and have made some amazing friends in my four and a half years, but I'm still a striped elephant in a land full of elephants, elephants of more shades and religions, but I keep showing up in the communities I wanna be part of. So when a striped elephant or a blue or purple or polka dot elephant shows up in your communities time after time, smile and let them know they're welcome, stripes and all. Thank you. Thank you, Angina. I will never think of an elephant the same way again. <laughs> I appreciate that. Our last storyteller of the evening, but certainly not least, is Prashant. Prashant Nima grew up in India and moved to Seattle in the summer of 2001. Initially, he came to work for Microsoft, which he did for uh, two years. Then he soon found his home and community here in Bellevue. At first, his community was limited to Indian friends at work, but he's been expanding his circle recently. Now, during the day, he works for Facebook, where he focuses on speeding things up. In the evening, he switches into his alter ego and tries to make the world slow down and pay attention, or so he thinks. Prashant is a founding member of Network for Unity, a young Eastside organization that aims to nurture solidarity and harmony across identities. He's also a board member for the Meta Center for Nonviolence and a volunteer for ASHA for Education. He's going to tell us about an interesting experiment he's running here in our community. Prashant? Two years ago, I ran into a friend of mine at an event. There he revealed something about his past that made me realize that he went through a very different childhood than mine. We are both Indian. Though an outsider cannot tell us apart, our birth designated both of us to very different experiences. As an oppressive system, the Indian caste system is just as brutal as American racism. My friend belonged to the bottom of this system and I to the top. Listening to his story, I understood the differences between my theoretical understanding of the system and his lived reality. I later learned from him that because of my ignorance about the system, I was a beneficiary, a participant, and a promoter of that system. This drove me mad with anger and guilt. When sanity returned, I saw the reasons of my ignorance. I saw parallels of that in the new society had, I had moved into. One of the reasons that caught my attention was 
something I call learned, learned segregation. I saw people choosing to spend most of their time, emotion, and money on small set of familiar but comfortable people. There's nothing wrong in that. But I feel that when this is practiced at a large scale, it leads to a situation where people are ignorant about other set of people. Just like in the case of my friend and I. I'm an engineer. I see a problem, I want to solve it. So I took upon myself to re-engineer the society around me. I'm kidding. <laughs> I just did what any other sane person will do. I try to look for people working on the same problem. Last year, a few friends and I started a small group that aims to achieve inter-identity unity in the East Side. It's called Network for Unity. Our goal is to create more social bonds between people across various identities. When I say identities, I mean it in every possible way. Ages, gender, races, ethnicities, abilities, sexual orientation, everything that can potentially separate us. This is how I en ended up here to talk to concerned and committed people like you. So everyone in this room is part of my re-engineering project now. <laughs> Still not satisfied, I kept wondering if there was something else I could do. After all, you cannot organize peace marches and community picnic every day. <laughs> I realized that if one honest discussion could teach me so much, what would several of them do? That's it, I said. I'm going to make many such conversations. This meant talking to strangers. No, wait. It meant making the strangers talk to me. <laughs> so one morning, I'm thinking about where I could meet strangers willing to talk to me. I needed strangers, and I needed diversity. So bars were out of question. I had recently read somewhere that people who frequently visit public parks were more likely to be extroverts. Bingo, I said to myself. <laughs> if there is a safe place to run this experiment, it must be the park. Now, I guess all of you know about Crossroad Parks in Bellevue. Lovely park. My family has been regular at that park in the summer, and it has amazing diversity, ethnic diversity to be very correct. So I decided to hang out there and treat it as a lab for my social experiment. My next challenge was to find a way to get these extrovert parkers to talk to me. <laughs> I saw people who had dogs made friends really quickly. I didn't have a dog. <laughs> but I have a son. So I used my son as an icebreaker. <laughs> when a stranger sees me at a park, their limbic system, the fight or flight system, probably sees a large-sized middle-aged Indian man. But when I follow with my son, the stranger sees a dad. It helps to switch identities at time. A few days into my experiment, I faced a little motivational problem. I still wasn't able to initiate the conversation with too many people. There was a friendly Chinese guy, Tunda, who tried to talk to me, but he spoke no English. <laughs> then one day, I saw him hanging out with a bunch of Indians who had come to visit their children from India. I was shocked. It wasn't common for Indians to know Chinese, even though we are neighbor. <laughs> I caught up with them and asked the Indian person, can you speak Chinese? He said, no. Then how the hell are you guys talking? <laughs> Somehow, he replied, and Tundas nodded in agreement. Both smiled mischievously. It was an aha moment for me. We later ended up using Microsoft and Google Translator, and they both learned a lot about each other. As for me, what I learned was that human relationship can percolate through many impossibilities. Then there was another episode where once we were taking help of a Chinese lady who was married to an American guy, and we were taking her help to talk to Tunda. During the course, he said something to her which we felt was rude. She said it was not uncommon for some older Chinese people to be, un to be uncomfortable with interracial marriages. We had grown fond of Tunda, and we were a bit shocked. But that day, I learned that in this experiment, 
I will meet many people who will, because of their own biases, say or do things that will make me cringe. I have to find ways to focus on commonalities and to be able to ignore that what can be overlooked. I was here to learn, not to teach. The other thing I learned was that I need to be interesting enough for conversations. <laughs> now, I don't have too many skills, so it makes it a bit difficult. But if you know some art, music, dance, sports, painting, all of these things can help you initiate conversations. So if you have these capabilities, please come to me. <laughs> Needless to say, the experiment will break down at some point. There will be conflicts. I have to be prepared for handling them or moving on from such points. There is another episode that comes to my mind where my wife had some trouble with a particular boy misbehaving in the park. She started to walk towards his mom, ready to complain. I was petrified. I was petrified of their argument causing a breakdown in my experiment. <laughs> I could almost read Bellevue reporter mentioning a cultural war, war tomorrow. <laughs> Thankfully, it didn't end that way. When I caught up with them, I realized they were engaged in a very mundane discussion. The mom had already agreed about her son's behavior. I learned that there will be times when some respectful confrontation will be necessary, especially when it comes to children. I can go on and on. There are one story for every day of summer I spent there. But it's time to wrap up. I want to tell you that no matter where this experiment goes this summer, it has already immensely rewarded me. My social circle has expanded now, and it only makes me more receptive to new people, ideas, and thoughts. People who know of my experiment also feel very comfortable sharing their own experiences. The radius of my experiment has also gone beyond the park. It now includes co-worker and poor Uber drivers who are trapped with me in the car. <laughs> and evil people who happen to be friends with me on Facebook. Each has a unique story to tell. One of the gentlemen in the park shared an interesting secret with me. Apparently, he used to be a smuggler in the 70s, and he used to smuggle watches. It was a big thing in India back, back then. Then there was a, this Uber driver from Gambia who told me that Amitabh Bachchan, my childhood favorite Bollywood star, was his childhood favorite too. I didn't know they watched Bollywood movie too. <laughs> Another Iraqi friend told me about losing his father and brother in a roadside bombing, and then how he made it to America. Even my friends from India now tell me about challenges they face as minority there. These rewarding and touching stories just keep coming. The most important lesson I want you to live with tonight is actually a paradox. What I have learned is that if you pretend to not see the stripes, as Angina said, if you pretend that you don't see differences, you see everybody as human, we are all elephants, then subconsciously, subconsciously you end up, you subconsciously you end up not believing that. You, you're trying to still say, subconsciously that we are different. If you try to pretend that we are not different. On the other hand, if you learn to see, appreciate, and recognize the stripes, you are more likely to understand that deep down we are same. It is no-brainer, actually. I'll give you an example. Another friend of mine from Gambia worries about experiences his son will go through in America because of the color of his skin, you see. He's definitely going to act differently than me. But deep down, we both love our children and care for their future. This is why I want everyone to understand why Angina wants her stripes to be seen. Last but not the least, my family, and especially my wife, Priyati, has been very supportive. It's a big deal to tag along a mad scientist in a park. <laughs> but I am sure they are also reaping benefits of this new social awakening. I land here with two appeals. One, if you happen to be at Crossroad Park this summer, please be my guinea pig. <laughs> my second appeal is to people who run this city. 
please continue to support the park. We love them. Perhaps in future, a newcomer, Angina, will meet an old-timer, Prashant, here, ready to see her stripes and welcome her into this community. Thank you. So I wanted to um, to let you know that Janice Janice is here tonight. Janice Son, she's also a council member, and she came in after we were doing the welcome. So I wanted to. <laughs> so thank you so much. The stories were amazing, as they always are. But this was especially oh overwhelming tonight. You guys all did amazing, amazing job. Um,